Amen. It's raining on the outside. There's a different kind of rain falling on the inside today. We're so thankful you're here. If you're a guest with us today, I'm Pastor Lynn, and it's so awesome to know what God is doing a week from Wednesday, just like Aaron was telling you, our Accelerate Conference. Please set aside your time. We'll have services every night, Wednesday through Saturday night at 7, and we're doing one single Sunday morning at 10 a.m. a week from next Sunday. And uh, to just bring a real strong exclamation, it's just a powerful time. We're doing morning meetings on Saturday only. And so it is going to be just, uh, uh, we're changing it up a bit, but it's going to be a powerful time. And I'm so excited to know what God is doing here, what God is doing uh, in the earth. It's good to have my sister back and Jadine, who just, uh, just were in Colombia, speaking a great women's conference there in Ibagué, Colombia, and just continue to keep that ministry in your prayer and, and just... Uh, know that God is doing some great things in the earth, and we're going to hear about that. And so since we have such uh, awesome speakers coming in this conference, I may not get a word in edgewise, so I'm doing all my Accelerate speaking before the conference gets here, and uh, God is accelerating us. How many were here last Sunday morning? Raise your hand. All right. Amen. You know kind of what we're, at, what we're doing today. How many were not here last Sunday morning at all? All right, you got to get the, uh, uh, the CD to catch up a little bit, but you're going to love what God is doing. We started uh, a single message that actually had to be done in two parts because of its intensity. This is the second part of a two-part message in this kind of Accelerate series that we're doing. And we began reading last week in Ephesians 1, kind of looking into one of the densest passages in the New Testament. And in this passage of Ephesians 1, starting in verse 3, ending in verse 14, if you looked at it in the original Greek language, it is one sentence. One 202-word sentence. In fact, the longest single sentence in the Bible. Now, when it's translated in your Bible, you'll see that it's broken into around three or four sentences. But originally, it was one sentence. And it's a powerful explosion of joy. And the big idea that holds it all together is that we are blessed. Did you know that you're blessed? Do you know that you are a blessed people? And I want you to see this today. Paul is writing this to Ephesus, to Christians everywhere, and he's writing it from prison. But before I get back into Ephesians 1, I want to begin the second part of Ephesians 1 by asking this question. Who do you think you are? Who are you? How do you perceive yourself? How do you introduce yourself? How would you tell somebody about you? Now, in mainstream pop psychology today, they talk a lot about self-esteem or self-image or self-awareness, right? But here at Jubilee, we like to use the language of identity. What is your identity? Who are you? Not just what are you going to do, but who are you? And this is a very important question because it's the one thing that changes everything. Who you are determines the outflow of what you do because when you know who you are, you know what to do. And when you don't know who you are, you don't know what to do. And this is real important, and I've used this illustration many times, but if you need to step out and go to the restroom during this service, you're going to have two doors that you can go through, and you can go behind either door and get the job done that you need to do. And I promise you that when you go to those doors and you find them, that you are not going to have to pray and fast to get revelation about which door to use. You're not going to have to wait on God. You're not going to have to sit and think about it. You're not going to have to say, God, please lead me, God. I don't want to make a wrong decision here, God. Lead me through the right door that I need to. No, you're going to know which door to go through because you know who you are, right? 
If you're a man, you go through the men's door. If you're a woman, you go through the women's door. And if you go through the wrong door trying to do the right thing, how many know you could be in a bad situation? Right? You could be in a very difficult circumstance, and in some places you might even get arrested. So you need to know who you are so you know which door to go through in your life and in the plan and purpose of God. There's all kinds of doors to go through. And you can walk through any of them and do things for God to, to accomplish things that you need to accomplish. But if you don't know who you are, you might go through the wrong door trying to do the right thing and you end up frustrated. Or you end up in a difficult situation. Or you end up frustrating someone else. Because you're not doing what you're supposed to do, where you're supposed to do it. And it comes back to knowing who you are. So this identity question is very important. So how would you answer that question? I am blank. And there's probably lots of things, depending on the time of your life, the time of day, that you might say, you know, I'm tired, I'm, I'm happy, I'm young, I'm old, I'm smart, I'm stupid, I'm, I, I'm loved, nobody loves me, I'm single, I'm married, I'm divorced, I'm, I'm, I'm successful, I'm a failure. There's a lot of things you could put after that question, right? After that statement, I am, and finish that statement, right? It's a question that we all ask ourselves, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. Sometimes other people answer that for us, right? It starts, that starts when you're little, right? Were you the firstborn child? Were you the baby of the family, right? Were you the middle child? Do you have middle child syndrome, right? We put kind of labels on all of these things, uh, what were you like? Were you the funny kid? Were you the chubby kid? Were you the athletic kid? Were you the artsy kid? Were you the nerd? Who were you? You know, what, what did you do? And as we continue to move forward in life, then we come into our teenage years. And then it becomes even more complicated because you have no idea who you are and you're trying to find out and you get new relationships, you have new responsibilities, you have new authorities and everybody gives you input about who they think you are or who they think you should be. And appearances then in that time of life become very important and then you move from there into your college age years and suddenly you have this opportunity to reinvent yourself, to start a career, to get trained, to go to college. You may try to go away, you might try to start fresh, you might make new decisions about how you look, your lifestyle, your activities, whether or not uh, your, your faith and, and Christian walk is real. You might, uh, your, your decisions, your pursuits, and then you move from there past that time of your life on into your 20s and 30s, and it's an identity crisis all over again because now you have to be an adult, right? And so, well, where will I work? And how many know once you, you know, pass 25 and your insurance drops, then you start wondering if there's anything else to look forward to. And of course, we know there is, but you, you ask all of these questions. Will I make enough money? What am I gonna drive? How am I gonna pay the bills? Will I be in a relationship? If I get a career job, then that consumes my identity. Can I succeed if I thrive, if I get promoted, if I earn seniority? That's gonna define me, right? And then if you get married, then your identity gets conflicted all again because you thought your spouse was gonna help you become who you're supposed to be and they were thinking the same thing about you, right? And suddenly you got two self-focused people with separate identity issues colliding together into misery and we call that marriage, right? Now, for the woman, that can be difficult, especially because women might be, when they're single, uh, focused in certain areas, uh, independent, career-minded, but now I'm married, and the Bible says, well, my husband has to be the leader, and I have to respect him, and I'm not sure he needs to be respected. My wife asked me after the first service, she says, you're not targeting me with that question, are you? And I said, of course not, dear, because that is absolutely the right answer, always. And... Uh, no, but you know what I mean. You, you have all of these things, and through your life, when your life shifts, you shift. Your identity then gets re-challenged all over again, and this whole question about who you are and what your purpose is and why you're here, and it continues on and on. And then kids come, right? And now you're on the identity roller coaster all over again with new feelings, new emotions, new responsibilities because the baby becomes the center of around which the family orbits, right? 
It determines when you eat. It determines when you sleep. It determines if you sleep. It determines how you spend your money. It determines how your life is organized. Hobbies, friendships, free time. All those things get redefined when kids come. How many with kids know what I'm talking about? Exactly, right? Everything gets affected. Then your kids grow older and they don't need you as much as they used to. And now that creates a whole other problem. I always say that this is how God kind of has his sense of humor. Whenever teenagers come into our lives, we can understand God a little bit more. He says, now you know how it feels to have somebody created in your own image that de denies your existence. And that's exactly what happens, right? And so as kids get older, they move on, they begin their own lives, and you hit the empty nest season, and your identity gets shaken again. And then there are crises that can come in your relationships, in your marriage, grown kids, grandkids, death of people in your family, loneliness. And when it's all said and done, your identity is in total crisis, total conflict, total chaos all the time. Do you ever feel that way? I mean, do you feel that way? How do you answer that question? And it doesn't hit us always consciously. It's not like daily I'm, I'm, I'm waking up wondering who I am. But on the inside, there's this constant redefinition of who I am, why I'm here, what I'm going through. So let's begin to answer this question today by asking a different question. And here's the different question I want to ask you today. Who does God say that you are? Who does God say you are? Let's find that answer going right to the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, look there in verse 26. And Genesis actually is a word that means beginnings. And in Genesis we find the beginning of everything except for God because he is the creator of all things. And there we also find the beginning of our identity. And this is very important to understand. Look at it, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man. The word for man is the word mankind. It means men and women in our image. Now I want you to look at this. God is singular, but when it says, the quote he says, let us in our image. Who else is there? Us and our. This is representing God as Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, working in triune power, creating the world, creating us. And he says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And this is identity language right here. And here is where our identity begins. He goes on to say, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. In the hierarchy of things, he put man above the rest of creation. So God created man in his own image. There's the word again. In the image of God, he created him Male and female, he created them. And then one of the most important phrases you will read in the next verse, it says, then God blessed them. If you underline things in your Bible, I would underline that phrase, then God blessed them. Because when you see that the very first thing God did when he created mankind is he put his blessing on them. And that blessing is connected to the fact that you are created in the image and the likeness of God. In and according to the nature of God. This becomes the foundation for your identity. And this is very important because if you miss this, you miss everything. And so as we continue walking through this, we're looking at this idea of blessing. And we come full circle to what we were talking about last week in Ephesians 1. Being pushed, being propelled, accelerated by the blessing of God. 
and that blessing connected to the identity of who you are. This is very important. What I want you to see today is that your very identity is blessed. Not that God blesses your identity. Your identity is blessed. It is the blessing of God. It is in the image of God in its foundation. And God delights in blessing. God begins us and he defines us by blessing. And God begins you and he defines you by blessing you. And I want you to understand this today. He's a father who blesses his children. He loves them. He cares for them. He's generous toward them. So that's the big idea of this two-part message not only that God likes to bless his people, but he identifies us by his blessing. And by his own blessed image, he gives us our identity. So look back now with that in mind at Ephesians 1. And Paul begins this statement talking about blessing the God who has blessed us. And he begins to unfold this explosion of blessing and purpose and reality and reason for life. He just unfolds it in this massive sentence. And this is what we're looking at today. I'm going to read the entire passage again today, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every Spiritual blessing. Say every. With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. According to to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. And this is where we kind of got to last time. Let's read on. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that at the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. And in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. That is an enormous, powerful passage that speaks about who you are. And I want to look at this today. In the last message, we looked at the most important part of this whole passage, which were the words, in Christ. Remember that? Everything's in Christ. Our blessing, our identity is in Christ. And God opened the doorway for that identity by giving to us himself. Remember, replacing us with Christ. Putting Jesus in our place, receiving our condemnation. And putting us in Christ's place where we receive his blessing and identity. You remember talking about that. So everything we're talking about here is in Christ. So if you're not in Christ, this isn't going to apply to you. But if you're in Christ, it all applies to you. What blessings come from being in Christ? Holiness, 
destiny, purpose, adoption, right? And so now we're going to look on and go a little deeper looking at verse 7. And this is that you have an identity that is based on and blessed through redemption. And I want you to look at this word. This is powerful. This passage just keeps exploding. It's like a, a fireworks display. It's just getting bigger and more glorious as it continues. Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now in our culture, we use the language of addiction to describe internal bondages many times. In the Bible, it uses the language of slavery. It's the same thing. It means that something controls us, something masters us, something has enslaved us, something is out to harm and destroy us, and we need to be redeemed. We need to be set free. We need to be delivered. We need to be released. And this idea appears hundreds of times in the Bible because it is the foundation of the gospel message. God's people were given redemption, right? From the Egyptian slaves, right? They were, they were the family of Abram. They eventually were taken into slavery in Egypt, God delivered them, brought them through the wilderness, and ultimately gave them a new identity, the nation of Israel. They were liberated, they were received, uh, or they were free, and they received a new identity. They walked out of Egypt, and God was with them. They did not walk out of Egypt into the promised land. They walked out of Egypt into the desert. Across an ocean, supernaturally, God parted the sea. He provided for them. He blessed them in the wilderness. He showed them who he was. He taught them how to be dependent on him and ultimately led them to their destination. It's exactly what, what happens. It's exactly what Paul's writing about in Ephesians. Here's the big idea. When he says we have redemption through his blood, he's saying that our faith in Christ and our trust in the sacrifice on the cross redeems us, right? It frees us, it buys us, it, it brings us out of this place of slavery into a place of freedom from everything that comes against us, our sin, everything connected to our sin, our issues, our crisis, our addictions, our bondages, our poverty, our sickness, all of these things can be broken through the power that comes from the blood of Jesus. Why the blood of Jesus? That's kind of a, a, a graphic thing when you think about it, but it's because life is in the blood. In the natural, your blood carries life to your whole body, right? It carries the oxygen, it carries the nourishment, everything that your body needs to live and function according to its purpose. In the same way, the blood of Christ, when he died, right, his death, his blood through that death came to give you the life that he had to flow through all of your life to bring you into your purpose so you can function for the reason you were created. But you have to understand this. There has to be faith in Christ, right, in his sacrifice to receive his redemption in our life. Otherwise, you will be controlled by other things. You'll be controlled by your emotions. You'll be controlled by your crisis. You'll be controlled by your job. You'll be controlled by your addictions. You'll be controlled by whatever, except for God. And God wants to take all of those things out of control, and he wants to come into the control. And that's powerful. So we worship him in freedom with a new life. That life affects anyone beginning with, begins, uh, sorry, it affects everything beginning with our salvation. And it keeps us from being destroyed by the enemy. And so now you don't have to accept the curse of sin anymore. Doesn't mean life's perfect and you don't experience bad things, but it means you have power over it now. You have control in your life because Jesus has redeemed you. So what enslaves you? What has mastered you? What rules over you? Jesus has come to free you. 
And by the power of his blood, you can walk with him in a brand new life. That is who you are. You are redeemed. Come on, just say that for a minute. Say, I am redeemed. The blessing of redemption. Well, connected to that blessing of redemption is how redemption happens. The Bible says, by the blessing of forgiveness. Look at this. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So freedom happens through forgiveness. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. What things in your life do you regret? What haunts you? If you looked back in your life, if there was one thing you could do over, what would it be? Many of you may know immediately something or maybe more than one thing you would do differently. Why? Because we feel the pain, we feel the burden, we feel the shame, we feel the condemnation. Maybe we're still affected by the complications that came through those issues. Come on, if a detailed biography, biography was written of your life, it was absolutely true. Every detail was written out. How easy would that be for you to read about yourself? There's places I don't want to read. There's places I want to erase, right? There's places I want to forget about. But you know what that means? That means we are in a desperate position for forgiveness. You are in a desperate place and a desperate need for forgiveness. And here it says we are forgiven for our sins, our trespasses, right? When God sets a standard and we don't follow it, when we go our own way, when we make our own decisions, when we react in our own emotions, we think God may not be connected to what we're doing. We don't understand it. His word is something hard for us or it's something limiting to us. So we go and we make our own decision and then we make the decision and it doesn't work out and it ultimately never works out and then we have regret, right? We regret being foolish. We regret making a bad decision. We regret being rebellious. We regret our sin. And so here's the thing. When you make a mistake, and everybody does, when you cross the line that God said not to cross, and everybody does, you have this issue of sin, and you have to do something with it. You can't just pretend like it's not there. It's there, and every person has to do something with their sin. There's lots of things you can do with it. You can deny it, right? I didn't do it. You can blame somebody else, it's their fault. You can excuse it, well, there were unavoidable circumstances, I had to, I couldn't help it. You can diminish it, well, it's really not that big of a deal. Other people have done a lot worse than I've done. You can hide it, I hope I don't get caught, or you can punish yourself for it, well, I need to experience pain or I deserve all of this stuff that I'm, I'm getting because of what I did, or, you can be forgiven. Now, I like the last option better than the other options. I don't know about you. I like to be forgiven more than all of that other stuff, but we have to do something with it. And everybody does these kind of things with their issues, but God is telling you, you can be forgiven. One of Jesus' final words from the cross is, Father, Forgive them. They don't even have any idea what they're doing. Now listen, if you are in Christ, you are forgiven. Now you gotta hear this today. If you are in Christ, you're forgiven. I want you to feel that. I want the Holy Spirit to enable and empower you right now to feel what I'm saying to you. The Lord Jesus today wants you to know that he forgives you. You're forgiven. That's a blessing, right? Because we know sometimes even as Christians we have faith, we know forgiveness is there, but the issues that we have, that we've carried, that we've done, that's been done to us, 
still affect us. It still hangs on. But when you understand that when you're in Christ, you're forgiven, it comes and erases that. It takes it away. It removes it. It means that you don't have a debt now to pay back. You don't have to pay back God for your forgiveness. You don't have to endure pain or suffering even if you deserve it. It means that Christ has done everything for you. It means he has received what you might have deserved or what I've deserved. And when he died on the cross, he paid the full debt for our sin and you're forgiven. And because of that forgiveness, you're redeemed and you're free and you don't have to be held in bondage and addiction to anything. Because you're free, amen? That's a blessing. That's a blessing. And you're forgiven and Paul doesn't stop there. He goes even deeper. He says, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now, he doesn't just say his grace, but he says according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us. It's like God having a pot of gold called grace and he just dumps it on top of you. That's how this happens. This is amazing, guys. Listen, and he says, in wisdom and prudence, that means that God, in his wisdom, thought through this, saw you before the world was created, knew exactly what would happen to you, knew every mistake that you would make, and created you anyway in his wisdom and prudence, and gave you grace to forgive you from everything, to redeem you from every bondage, so that you could still fulfill your purpose. That's powerful. God did this intentionally. It says, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure. In other words, God didn't just secretly keep his desires. He reveals it to you. His purpose, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. He decided to do it. That in the dispensation, that is a big theological word that just means a time period, a set time for a purpose. That in this set time where the end comes together, he gathers together in one all things, and here's those words again, in Christ. Both which are in heaven and on earth. Everything coming together. Now listen, I'm going to, Let's look at this for just a minute because have you ever been with somebody who's just really a generous person? They give even when they don't have it to give. They do things for you to the point that it's almost embarrassing to receive it because they just give. Have you ever known somebody like that? They're just so generous. They give more than they should give, right? It's like a kid going out with grandpa or grandma, you know? And, and they just do things that the kids really don't deserve and they overlook all the reasons they don't deserve it, right? My dad, when he was living, loved to do that for his grandkids. You know, he's like the fourth scoop of ice cream grandpa. You know, have you ever had that? When you really, one scoop would be just fine and probably you didn't even deserve that one. And you're now in the third or fourth scoop. And it's just like, there's just no limits, right? That's how God is with his grace. That's the riches. That's the wealth of the grace of God that he pours on you. He's a giver. He's generous. And that's who he is. And here's the thing. Since you are created in his identity, every time you're generous, every time you give abundantly, every time you give without expecting anything else just to bless somebody else, you're walking in your identity in the image of God. Every time you're generous with your love, every time you're generous with your compassion, you're generous with your home, you're generous with your food, you're generous with your finances, you are reflecting the identity and image of God. And when we're stingy and we hold back and we look out for other things and we push other people away, we're reflecting an identity that is not in Christ. This is who we have to be as Christians. This is who God has called us to be. It's who we are. And he makes his grace abound toward us. God is lavish. And he's called us to be lavish. And he makes known his mystery just because he likes to reveal himself. 
he makes known the mystery of his will concerning you just because he wants to, because he likes it, because he likes to give himself to you, and he likes your utter joy and surprise when you open up and find who God really is. Right? And so in the end, the Bible says he brings all things together. Where? In Christ. All of this is in Christ. If you are in Christ, you are connected to God's blessings and you're connected to your identity. If you are not in Christ, you live outside of God's blessings and you have no true sense of your identity and you're just going to spin around like a compass that's broken. What good is a compass if you're lost in the woods and you have a compass that doesn't point north? It has no true sense of north, no true sense of direction. You're going to end up lost. You're going to end up spinning in circles and you won't know which direction you're going because you have no guide. This is what the Bible says that being in Christ is like. It's like having that compass of direction, knowing your identity, knowing who you are, knowing where to go. But if you're choosing to not be in Christ, none of that applies to you. You're going to be lost. You're going to be spinning around and you're going to wonder what in the heck does any of this mean? That's what it's going to be like. And so you have to understand where God is at. I'm not saying that natural blessings don't come to people that are not in Christ. They do. This is something called common grace. Common grace that God bestows on all humanity. Believers and unbelievers alike. Just because of his love and mercy, he holds the earth from self-destructing. And you'll go through life, even if you completely deny God's existence, you'll still go through life and you'll have some good things happen and some bad things happen. The Bible's very clear about that. It says the sun rises on the believer and the unbeliever. It rains on the just and the unjust. Right? Crops will grow to feed the believer and the unbeliever. Why? Because God loves the whole world. And because Peter said God is being patient, waiting, offering repentance, hoping that you'll come to him and see your purpose and life in him. Right? This is the whole idea. And that love brings the possibilities of increase. It brings the possibilities of success. It brings the possibilities of favor, of kindness, of provision. But let me tell you something. There's also another grace besides common grace. There's a special grace that is in Christ. A unique, purpose-driven, identity-focused grace for God's people. Common grace helps in the practical areas of life, but it's only in special grace that you can understand the reason for all of it. It's only in special grace that you understand that what is in this life is just right here, and you don't even see beyond this life to what's really important. That's the life to come. You discover your purpose, your identity in special grace. I was at a funeral this week of a young man who died who's 36 years old. And I'm sitting there listening. I didn't know the young man personally, listening to many of his friends who were very broken about his death, talking about their many experiences together, doing, living life, high adrenaline, going forward, getting as much adventure as they could get out of life, and, and just nonstop until it stopped at 36 years. And then life was over, right? It was in. You lived full life, huge, big, passionate life, 36 years, bam, it's done. And he died out of an addiction, out of an overdose. And you see what was there. And you see the sadness and the brokenness of people that loved and saw the purpose that's what life is like when you're not in Christ. You better get all you can get here because here's all you got. And if you're not in Christ, this is as close to heaven as you will ever see. Right here. Bam. But if you are in Christ, this is as close to hell as you'll ever see. Thank God for that. Amen. It just depends 
on where you're at. You see, because this life here is just a spot. Eternity is this. And if we don't understand that what we're doing in this life has a purpose that extends beyond this life, it's pretty depressing. Right? If we don't get that, we miss everything. We miss all of who God is. We miss all of who we are. It's not some religious experience or comparing this belief system to that belief system. It's missing everything. It's missing it all. You have to understand how vital it is for you to be in Christ, for your family to be in Christ, for everything you do and everything you think about to be in Christ. Because this is Powerful. And, and when you understand this grace that comes, sometimes we become so familiar with Christian words that we cease to be astounded by them. And grace is one of those words. We use grace a lot, amazing grace. We say grace over our meals, right? But God, through his grace, offers you God. He gives you the very best of what he could give you, which is himself, because nothing is bigger it's powerful. And then he changes you and he gives you a purpose and he gives you an identity and his grace flows through you so that the blessing in you can bless others. Isn't that great? It's an amazing life. It's a supernatural life. And that life accelerates us into his purposes. Where are the evidences of God's grace in your life? That's my question today. What things has he provided for you what things has he saved you from and if you look at this holiness destination adoption redemption forgiveness where does it all come from grace grace is really the source it's the life spring of all the blessings of god this empowers us it identifies us it connects us and it makes us strong so that we could live the life in christ with christ for christ and through christ Practically, this means the way that we treat each other also has to be seated and sourced in grace. You have to have grace for me, right? No one understands this better than my wife. You have to have grace for me. I have to have grace for you, right? We have to have grace. And he continues. This is quite a sentence, isn't it? Look at verse 11. He says, in him... Also, we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things. Say all things. How many is in all? All. He works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Now look at this. First of all, you have to understand that there is an inheritance prepared for you that the blessing does not begin and end in this life it begins here but it definitely doesn't end here there is an inheritance there is a place there is something that your purpose is pushing toward and God provides but listen his provision is for a purpose and we have a lot of thoughts out there of people that preach prosperity well God wants to prosper you wants to give you this thing and if you're not prospering then you're not having faith and then you have other people here that says we shouldn't preach prosperity that's that's missing the point it's it's not really about who God is and both of them are wrong both of them are wrong here's the idea God is a father and he blesses you and that blessing and prosperity are there for you but it's not just to make your life better it's so that you can walk in your purpose. And he blesses you according to the counsel of his will. Whatever the will of God is for you, whatever the purposes of God are for you, he blesses you according to that purpose. And you have to be stewards of the blessing he blesses you with. Don't look at what you don't have. Ask God how you use what you do have for the purpose that he's called you to walk in. 
that's how all this works. And with that, there is a greater inheritance, a greater prosperity, a greater blessing that you haven't even imagined that is waiting for you. This is the blessing. And we have to walk with our lives in alignment with the will of God because all things regarding blessing and identity work according to God's will. If you want to try to do it differently, go ahead, have fun. But I'm telling you, all things work according to God's will. And he said, and when you get this, you become sealed when you believe, when you understand what the gospel is doing. And, and he's writing this. You know where Paul's writing this? He's writing this from the pit of a dungeon. He's writing this from prison. Writing about the abundant blessings of God, the abundant grace of God, right? Because Paul understood that this is so much more than what's outside. It's what's on the inside that's driving me, that's driving the apostle Paul to carry the gospel, to turn the world upside down, to connect people in a relationship with God through Christ. And we continue that work. Now in that day, if you had a possession, if you had something that belonged to you, you would put some kind of a seal on that, marking that possession, especially if it was valuable, as something that belongs to you. People still do this. They'll put their names on something. They'll put a tag on something. They will stamp it, brand it, right? But when you put your seal on something, it says, that belongs to me. In royalty days, if you were to send a letter that you wrote so they would know it was not somebody Forging your writing or signature, you would have a ring that was specifically designed like for you. And there was none other like it. And when you would put that envelope and close it, you would drop wax on it. And you would press that ring into that hot wax, leaving that mark. It was your seal. And as long as that seal wasn't broken, they would know that what was inside of it was authentic. That it was from the person who sent it. Listen. God has sealed you by the Holy Spirit. What that means is you belong to God. You are the possession of God. You are marked by God. You are sent by God. Now this is absolutely powerful, right? We belong to the Lord. If you are a Christian, you belong to God. The Bible is clear. It says your life is not your own. You are bought with a price. So our blessing is from the Father and it's through the Son and then the Holy Spirit comes and he marks you as the possession of God. So if somebody asks you, who are you? If you're wondering, well, who am I? Let me tell you the answer to the question. You are the possession of God. You are the treasure of God. You are marked by the Holy Spirit. That's a pretty strong identity to walk in. Amen? That's a pretty powerful identity. Man, it sure is quiet here for all of that blessing that I'm preaching about. You're scaring me a little bit. Listen, God wants you to know. Are you getting it, though? Come on, just show, nod, do something. Say, yeah, I'm getting it. Yeah, say, amen, amen. Say, I'm hungry, I'm ready to go to lunch, but I'm getting it. Amen? Listen, how many of you want to live for God? Do you? The Holy Spirit empowered the earthly life of Jesus. And before Jesus returned to heaven, he said, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to be your comforter. Your helper actually is the word. He comes to mark you. He comes to strengthen you. He comes to empower you. When the people of God gathered together after the resurrection of Jesus in the book of Acts, they were ready to go and do the ministry of Jesus, but Jesus said, not yet. Go and wait until the Holy Spirit comes and empowers you. Right? The Holy Spirit comes to empower you to do the work of God. He comes to empower you for you to walk in the purposes of God. He launches you forward into God's will and purpose by his power. And the Holy Spirit comes on you to give you that power to live according to to your purpose. And here's what I want you to know today about the Christian life. It's not the life that you live for God, but it's the life that God lives through you. 
Because if it's about the life I live for God, there's too much me in that, and there's going to be a lot of room for failure. Because I can't do it, at least not by myself. But when God comes and lives through me, how many know it's something very different? It's powerful, right? So it's Jesus sending the Holy Spirit to make you a new person in Christ, to live through the power of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean there's no effort on your behalf, but it's a Holy Spirit-empowered, grace-enabled effort. Amen? It's beyond your own ability. Yeah, it requires you to make a choice and a decision. God gave you your will, but within that, you're empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the purpose that he put in your life. And what he says here is, he is the guarantee of your inheritance. What? He is the guarantee. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee. The Holy Spirit of promise. The promise that Jesus said, I'm going to send you another one. That promise is the guarantee that God is going to continue to work in you and through you, pushing you forward in your purpose, bringing you to the ultimate place of your inheritance. And this is absolutely powerful. He causes you to be born again with a new nature, as a new person, with a new heart, with a new mind, and a new identity to live by a new power for a new purpose for an amazing Lord. Why does God do this? Here's why. It says it three times in this passage. To the praise of his glory. Now that's a lot of blessing. You're blessed in Christ with holiness, with destiny, with adoption, with redemption, with forgiveness, with grace, with inheritance, with promise, with purpose, sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Wow, why? To the praise of his glory. Verse six, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Verse 12, to the praise of his glory. Verse 14 again, to the praise of his glory. So what we do then, going all the way back to how Paul first wrote this passage, we bless the God who has blessed us. Your whole purpose is for God to get the glory. And let me tell you, God will get the glory with or without you. He, you can give him the glory or he will take his glory. But either way, he's getting the glory. He's God. He's the creator. We are the created. And this is very important. So what power and control do I have? None. It's all according to the counsel of his will. All things. Right? So our whole purpose is to glorify God in everything. That's why the Bible says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It doesn't say for everything give thanks. It says in everything give thanks. Amen? Not everything comes from God that you deal with. But God is there in everything. Leading you, guiding you, building you, strengthening you, growing you, pulling you, trying to get your attention, saying, look, look at who I am, look at where you are, understand your purpose. So today I want to bring this message to a close with an illustration. And it's an illustration that I read an article recently and I really liked it. And it was titled, Cat Theology versus Dog Theology. And here's how it goes. It's, say there's a cat and there's a dog. And they both have the same owner. And they both have the best owner a cat or a dog could ever have. The best master ever. They both sleep in very comfortable cat and dog beds. They eat very good food. They're groomed at the very best cat and dog spa, right? They're petted, they're spoken to, they're well treated, they're cared for in every way. These are spoiled pets. Have you ever known a spoiled pet before? How many of you have a spoiled pet? Yeah, there's a few of you in here, right? These pets are, they have the best owner ever. And here's what happens. Here's the difference. Here's what the cat thinks. And those of you who have cats know this is true. Right? The cat thinks, I must be an amazing and valuable cat to be treated so well. Right? 
Here's what the dog thinks, though. And those of you who have dogs know this is true. I must have an amazing and valuable master to be treated so well. You see the different perspective? You see the difference? And I want us to have dog theology. I like cats and dogs, but I want us to have dog theology, right? And a lot of times in the church, it's more of a cat theology. God loves me. God died for me. God blessed me. God has eternity for me. God has a new nature for me. God has an eternal home for me. He's building a mansion for me. And if something doesn't happen right for me, I get mad at God. Right? Because it's all about me. Look at how amazing I am. Look at how valuable I am. Look at how important I am. That's cat theology. But let me tell you something Here's what we need to see. It's not about looking how great and valuable I am. I'm the apple of God's eye. All of those things are true and God loves us. But here's the thing. It really says very little about me. And it says a whole lot about who God is. Look at how great he is. Look at what he has done. Look at all the promises he's doing. To live for the praise of his glorious grace is not to think that God is doing all of this so people can see me as glorious and worthy and more spiritual than and more deserving than. God does all of this so that he is seen about how glorious he is. That in spite of me, he blesses me anyway. That when I didn't do anything to deserve it, he just loves me. And he lavishes grace on me. How generous he is. How compassionate he is. How merciful he is. How long-suffering he is. How affectionate he is. How great is my master. Amen? So today, my desire is is for you to know how blessed you are. But I want you to know because of that how great God is. How he's blessed us. And then I want you to respond with the praise of his glory. Bless the Lord who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Praising the God who's worthy of being praised. Well, you don't know my circumstances. If you only understood, listen, you're missing it. If you're just looking, your circumstances will change tomorrow and they'll be back again the next day. Listen, it's not about that. It's about who God is. It's about the blessings. It's about your purpose. It's about him wanting to accelerate you. It's about life that matters. Do you need redemption? What needs to be redeemed for you today? What in your life needs redemption? What in your life needs freedom? It's in Christ. Do you need forgiveness? What in your life today needs to be forgiven? Who do you need to forgive? It can only happen in Christ. But in Him, you are forgiven. In Him, you are redeemed. You are free. Do you need grace? Where does God's grace need to touch you today? His grace has the ability to do what you cannot do, and it is found in Christ. God is establishing your purpose today. Come on, just close your eyes with me. God is establishing your identity today. Who are you God is establishing your hope God is establishing your inheritance and the Holy Spirit today is the guarantee of your inheritance in God who are you who does God say you are today you are his treasure You are his possession. You are an inheritor of the blessings of God if you are in Christ. Jesus, we praise you today. Lord, as I just sense your presence, God, I just sense you stepping into this room like the very person of Jesus himself is here. 
Lord, I see you, God, and I don't even understand why you would care enough with all of my stuff, all of the things I haven't done that I said I would. And you love me in spite of me, and you give me grace in spite of myself, and you push forward into me, God, with your blessings. So God, come today and stand beside every man and woman in this congregation. Lord, come and begin to fall in this place like rain, God. Lord, let the riches of your grace, your abundant grace, let it be poured out, God. Right now, Jesus. Right now. I want to ask everyone if you would stand to your feet. And hang with me for just a moment. If you're here today and there are places in your life where you need the grace of God. And how many know there are times and places where we need to touch God's grace? But you're here today and you need to draw from God's grace today. I want us to pray for you. If you're here today and you need redemption, if there's something you've been battling, something you've been struggling with, something that you can't break free in your own strength, it's one step forward, two steps back, I want you to come and say, God, I, the redemption of God is here today. If there's places where you need to be forgiven, his forgiveness is here for you today. It's in Christ. Maybe there's things that you're walking through. Maybe there's issues that you're believing God for today. Whatever it is, you need the grace of God to come and touch you today. It's here. His inheritance is here for you. You need to see your purpose. Whatever it is today, I want us to pray for you right now. How many want to touch God today? You want to walk after God. You want to obey God. You want the, life, the areas in your life to come. All right, if that's you and, and those areas apply, and you're like, I need to step into God's grace right now. Specifically, I need to step into his grace in an area of my life, whether it's your relationship with God or whether it's something you're walking through, whatever it is, I want you to slip out of your seat. I want you to come right now, quickly, and meet me right down here. If you're in the middle of the row, somebody will let you out, whatever. You're like, well, I come down to the altar and pray a lot. Well, come pray some more. Amen? Well, I've brought this to God a hundred times. Bring it a hundred and one times. Whatever it is, His redemption, His grace, His power, His ability is working on the inside of you for the praise of His glory. And you know what we're going to do in this sanctuary today? We're going to bless the Lord.